All right, welcome to Hoops Tonight, presented by FanDuel here at The Volume. Happy Friday, everybody, or happy Saturday morning when you're actually listening to this. I hope all of you guys had a great week and that you got big plans to relax this weekend. Just going to be hitting on two games in this show, the Warriors and the Bulls, and then that epic overtime game between the Miami Heat and the Boston Celtics. And then for those of you who were interested in a breakdown of the Bucks lakers game, I did a separate instant reaction video to that that you can find a little bit further back in the YouTube feed. You guys know the drill before we get started. Subscribe to the Volumes YouTube channel so you don't miss any more of our videos. Follow me on Twitter at underscore Jason LT so you guys don't miss any show announcements. And then last but not least, if you guys miss one of these videos and you can't get back over to YouTube to finish, you can find them wherever you get your podcasts under hoops tonight. And on that note, let's talk some basketball. So for the Warriors tonight, that was three quarters of Easy, breezy, dominant basketball. Never truly threatened. Steph kind of pulled back his usage a little bit and ceded the reins to Clay and to Jordan Poole to get a bunch of shots up, and that's exactly what they did. Of course, Jordan Poole got going, which was exactly what he needed. He had a really good game, I thought, against Dallas, particularly as a passer. It's so important for Jordan Poole to be making reads and to like primarily focus on shot creation rather than necessarily shot making. But you need to have both, and it was good to see him get have a good shot making game. Made a bunch of threes, made some tough shots. So those confident Jordan Poole shots that you know are so important to him when he's really, really in a groove. So you know the the nature of this game kind of allowed them to force feed him and let him get going. Clay was really just jacking shots up and took a lot of bad ones, particularly in the fourth quarter. But to Clay's credit, he made a couple of huge plays um, at the end of that game. He drew a post up foul on Goran Dragic and made two free throws. And then he hit a nice pull up jumper at the foul line that basically iced the game. But that kind of fast and loose nature of the first three quarters went away in the fourth quarter. And the fourth quarter to me was all about the Chicago Bulls going on runs against laziness from the Warriors, but then the Warriors taking back control of the game with their execution on both ends of the floor. The first run, the Bulls get it back within four. Um, Javante Green actually goes to the free throw line after an and one with a chance to get it back within three, and he misses the free throw, so they're still up four. But this stretch, the Warriors did it with offensive execution. You guys might remember a play that I drew out. Uh, well, didn't draw but I showed you guys on my Twitter feed and then in our last show, or it was a show earlier this week, um, where the Lakers or the Warriors, excuse me, run like a five out set where they have uh, Kevon Looney on the left, kind of like elbow extended up to the three point line, and Clay Thompson on the right elbow extended up to the three point line. And then the other two players are on the right side, right wing, right corner, spotting up. And Steph starts all the way on the left and he comes, he drags off the two screens on the top. And then Clay Thompson comes off of. Kevon Looney or Draymond Green, whoever the big is, off to the left wing with like a clear side. It's kind of like the Warriors version of a Spain pick and roll that they'll run. Most times Spain pick and roll, the shooter will start under the basket. This time they're just having Clay start up atop the key. But they ran it um, against the Minnesota Timberwolves in that game that I was talking about earlier, and Clay attacked closeout and got a floater. So those of you guys who watched that video I put on Twitter will know exactly which play I'm talking about. But the Warriors spanned this play two times in a row. Right when the Bulls got it back within four, the first time, both guards stayed with Steph Curry. Klay Thompson had a wide open three, like one that was so wide open that he got to take a free dribble to get the laces right and get his rhythm and knocked it down. Then Levine goes down and travels. Next time down the floor, they run the exact same thing. Both players stay with Steph, or excuse me, uh, uh, Klay's man stays with Klay this time, and as a result, Steph gets downhill on the screen. He gets into Vucevic's body and makes a right-handed layup. Now they're back up by eight. So again, Bulls go on a run. The Warriors settle down. They execute on offense. They get a stop. All of a sudden, it's back to eight. But then the Bulls went on another big run. Vucevic hit a tough jumper with Looney's hand in his face. Javante Green had a nice little backdoor cut with a layup. And then Zach Levine hits a three. All of a sudden, it's 110 to 109. And it's a one-point game, and ugh, it feels like the game's up in the air. And then the Warriors utterly and completely locked in on defense. And Chicago didn't score again until a meaningless Drogic layup with a few seconds left that Golden State conceded. Not only did they not score, if I'm remembering correctly from watching that game, they only got one shot off. They attempted four, and three of them were blocked. So they leaned on their defense to put the game away after they got it back within one. Draymond Green hit a massive three that wasn't really all that open. Then... 
Uh, Kevon Looney timed the DeRozan pull-up. DeRozan does like a hard hesitation dribble before he goes into that pull-up. So if you jump too early or if you jump too late, he can get it off. But if you time it right, Looney's got so much length on him there, he could get to the shot and he blocked it. Then Clay Thompson posts up on the left wing. They originally ran it as a post, uh, as like a post split cut, but um, they ended up pulling it out and trying to throw the ball into Clay in the post. This is what's wild. Clay Thompson has scored a grand total of four points on post ups this year, and instead of just allowing Clay Thompson to catch the ball and attempt a shot over Goran Dragic, Dragic got overzealous while the Bulls were in the penalty and fouled Clay on the post entry, and he was able to go in and make both uh, free throws. Then Draymond Green blocks Zach Levine at the rim on the play that got challenged. Then Clay goes down and sticks that pull-up jumper at the foul line. Then they go down and Draymond blocks an Alex Crusoe three with a closeout. And Draymond Green's always been one of the best players in the league at closing out. Then the game was over. So, like, the Bulls barely could even get a shot up once they got it back within one. But that's the Warriors for you. Like, they can mess around. Things can get tight. But when it comes to offensive execution and defensive habits – they're just better than most teams, and they're going to be able to close you out there. So it's a really nice win against a reeling Bulls team. The Bulls are now 4-9 and nine in their last 13 games. People were throwing out trades earlier today uh, in the last couple of days involving DeRozan and Vucevic, including the Lakers potentially trading Russell Westbrook for those two guys. If it gets much worse, they might have to consider it. Not necessarily the rush trade, but consider blowing this thing up. The, the tough part for Bulls fans is they don't really have a ton to be excited about. Aside from, like, I, I mean, I really like Ayo Desunmu is like a defensive guard that can do some stuff offensively. And Patrick Williams, you know, if you watch him on the right night, looks like a two-way wing. But neither of them look like stars, you know. Neither of them look like, you know, stars in the making. So it's a tough spot for the Bulls fans to be in. But when you do stuff like that, when you make a trade for a guy like Vucevic, and when you go out of your way to get a guy like DeRozan, you're going all in on that particular core working. And as a result, they just don't have a ton to work with now that that seems to not be working. Although the, the Bulls have a, a couple of signature wins this year, so they're always a threat if they can get things right. Um, I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about Draymond Green because in a, in addition to the massive three-point shot that he hit and the two blocks that he had at the end, he had 13 points, nine rebounds, 10 assists, and was a team-best plus 20. And so the reason why I bring that up is, you know, one of the keys to this season really turning around for the Warriors has been – Steve Kerr doing what I asked earlier, which is no more hockey, you know, line, line, you know, line changes, just stagger your starters with your subs. And one of the keys to this particular season has been staggering Draymond, particularly with Jordan Poole, not just with the bench, but with Jordan Poole coming into tonight when Jordan Poole has played without Draymond, the Warriors have had a minus 12 net rating, meaning they, they've been outscored by 12 points per 100 possessions in 757 possessions. Pretty big sample size. But when they play Draymond with Jordan Poole, the Warriors are plus four in 516 possessions, which is also a pretty big sample size. You know, just having Draymond there, one, so that when they run their screening actions, you have a real high IQ player that can capitalize on that attention that Jordan Poole commands. And then also just kind of reins in Jordan Poole's decision-making, having a really smart player on the floor. I'm a big believer in aggregate anything when it comes to a skill set. Aggregate shooting, aggregate quickness, aggregate size, aggregate length. Aggregate basketball IQ. You get a bunch of smart basketball players on the floor, good things usually will happen. Jordan Poole can be a little fast and loose with his decision-making sometime. Getting him a guy like Draymond in there to just kind of calm him down and get him in the right spots and getting, make him, uh, getting him to help him make the right decisions goes a long way. Um, and then defensively, Draymond can just make any unit work. It was really fun watching him guard DeMar DeRozan tonight picking him up full court sometimes, applying a bunch of pressure, making him feel uncomfortable. His really uh, long wingspan bothers him on that pull-up shot. Kind of reminded me of when Draymond switched on to Jalen Brown in the NBA Finals. You know, this is the type of versatility that comes with Draymond, and it's why he's one of the best defensive players in the league. It's not just the defensive anchor stuff and the backline stuff and the intensity and the, and the, the vocal leadership. He can straight up switch and guard some of the best perimeter scorers in the league, and that's a big part of what makes him – so valuable. You know, Jonathan Kaminga had a rough night tonight, uh, but I, I want to see him get more reps alongside Draymond at the four. I, I tried to talk about this a little bit on Tuesday night, but we were having all those technical difficulties. Um, the that In that Dallas game, the uh, Steve Kerr, for the first time this season, tried a lineup of Draymond Green with Dante DiVincenzo, Jordan Poole, Jonathan Kaminga, and Anthony Lamb. And that lineup was plus 12 in nine minutes against Dallas. As a matter of fact, this season... 
when Draymond Green and Jonathan Kaminga are on the floor together with no Jamichael Green, no James Wiseman, no Kevon Looney, and no Andrew Wiggins. So when Kaminga can truly play the four rather than playing the three where he's got to have more ball handling responsibilities, when he's truly at the four and Draymond is truly at the five, They've actually had a lot of success. They've in fifty-seven percent. Uh, excuse me, in fifty-seven possessions with that group, which is a small sample, but not nothing. It's half of a basketball game's worth. Um, in those fifty-seven possessions with Draymond and, and Kaminga at the four-five, the Warriors have a one thirty offensive rating and a ninety-two defensive rating. That's plus thirty-eight points per one hundred possessions. You know, a big part of it is. You know Draymond Green's offensive IQ; they could put him in those in those positions where he's in the short roll, which then tucks Kaminga in the weak side corner, where he doesn't have to make decisions. He just has to, if Draymond's roll into the rim, cut back door for the dunk or the lob, you know, the drop off or the lob, or crash the offensive glass. It simplifies his defense. Uh, it simplifies his decision making process. And then Jonathan Kaminga's defense has been the thing that separated him from the other young players on the roster, and it makes him an exciting prospect. He like he's just. Surprisingly big and strong, super long arms, freak athlete, moves his feet well. He's a good defensive player. Uh, so the Warriors are back over 500, and they have three winnable games coming up. They play the Rockets at home, the Pacers at home. Then they have a somewhat tough game on the road in Utah, but if they win all three of those, they're in a good spot heading into a couple of really tough matchups with the Boston Celtics and the Milwaukee Bucks back-to-back. All right, let's move on to this uh, Heat-Celtics game. This was a really entertaining game. I just just caught up on it here in the last half hour or so. So the Heat uh, won 120 to 116. Tatum had a nightmare shooting night, but I went back and watched all his shooting attempts. He was 5 for 18 from the field and 0 for 7 from 3, but I actually thought he got pretty decent shot quality. It kind of just felt like a nightmare game for him. You know, Bam had a bio in his post-game presser. was talking about how, you know, uh, they're just going to live with the result with Jason Tatum taking tough shots. And I get that, and I get that from a shot, from a philosophy. And don't get me wrong, if you're guarding Jason Tatum, you got to live with some of these step-back threes that he's taken. But, I mean, Tatum missed at least by my count, five layups, like right around the rim, like easy layups that he does not usually miss. You know, this has been Tatum's best rim finishing season of his career by far. He clearly worked a lot this season on finishing or off season on finishing through contact. And he's been hitting in like the mid seventies on high volume around the rim. Just a bad night. It happens. You know, Jimmy Butler, once again, just has the Celtics number. And anytime you put him in a big game like that, he's just just about guaranteed to play really to play really well. He had a massive jumper to almost seal the game in regulation, and then actually hit the one that iced the game in OT. Made all sorts of huge defensive plays, including a huge block on Jalen Brown at the rim in OT. Heat fans in general just have to feel good about having him back because he solves so many of their problems. But the real hero that I want to give a bunch of attention to right now is Bam Adebayo. So he had 28 points tonight on 18 shots. He scored 28 or more in three of his last four games. For the season, he's averaging a career-high 21 points per game on 59% true shooting. And he's just, in general, finally starting to be aggressive looking for his own shot rather than just trying to play within the flow of the offense, which is something that I've been begging for. You know, the the Heat have a significant... They have a lot of guys that can dribble and can shoot. But, you know, athleticism and physical tools are such an important deal, especially when you get into postseason environments. Like, I always talk about, like, the mismatch attacking forward. And... You know, with this Heat roster, one of the weaknesses for them is their guards can't really create shots unless they're coming over screens and getting advantages. And so they really only have one forward, who's Jim, Jimmy Butler, who can like consistently create his own shot against a mismatch. And that's been a severe limitation for them. And even with that limitation, they damn near won a title. They were one shot away from making the finals last year. So that, that's, I mean, obviously it's not the same as getting the trophy, but that's relatively close. So, you know, realistically, having Bam become another one of those guys, another big forward that can consistently attack a mismatch, that goes a long way towards solving a lot of Miami's offensive issues. You know, they need they need not just ultra-versatile, one of the best defensive players in the world, Bam. They need two-way Bam. They need more Anthony Davis than Rudy Gobert, if that makes sense. They need what they got tonight. So, like, it's 112-112. Jimmy Butler just blocks Jalen Brown at the rim, like a ridiculous block with his left hand extended out um, and, and snatches the basketball. They run down. And they clear out and isolate Bam Adebayo on the right block against Grant Williams. And Grant Williams is a great defensive player. This is a guy who was guarding Giannis and doing a pretty damn good job 
last year in the playoffs. And he just backs his way in on Grant, turns over his left shoulder, and knocks down a jump shot. A tough fadeaway jump shot over his left shoulder. That's difficult, high-level shot making. And that ended up giving the Heat the lead. You know, like that... That's the thing that's gonna that, that's the thing that's gonna put Miami over the edge. High level shot making from Bam, legit mismatch attacking from Bam, especially since for him and I, you know a lot of the shot making that he uh, displayed tonight was relatively close to the rim in that like five to seven foot range. That could be something that's really reliable in a playoff series. Look at the Lakers tonight with LeBron James and Anthony Davis. At the end of that game, they won with shot making at the rim, like making shots like five seven feet away from the basket. If Bam can get that stuff nailed down, that could be like Tim Duncan-esque reliable go-to scoring at the end of games or in big, you know, pivotal stretches of pivotal playoff games. Looking at some of the data, Bam has scored 50 points on 52 post-ups, which is below average, but he's been very good in isolation. He scored 71 points on 68 ISOs, including passes, which is in the 67th percentile in the NBA. Now, the Heat still desperately need a legit, two-way front court option just to add some depth there. My guess is they'll be very... I mean, they were literally playing Udonis Haslam in these games. Like, that's a problem, you know. Um, They're going to need to target somebody either in the trade market or in the buyout market to bolster that front court. But if this scoring burst from Bam is real, and I hope they keep feeding him all season to try to develop that further and further, there's some real LeBron AD type potential here. You know, what makes the LeBron AD pairing so devastating? It's... Not just that Anthony Davis and LeBron can combine for 72 points or whatever they did tonight. It's that on the other end of the floor, LeBron was guarding Giannis and Anthony Davis was guarding Giannis and AD was protecting the rim and they were grabbing all these contested rebounds and making all these pivotal defensive plays. That's the key. You need the the two-way pairing of superstars. You've seen it with Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. That sort of thing is such a valuable playoff weapon. And if Bam Adebayo can meet Jimmy Butler in that true two-way superstar level, that changes the way we have to evaluate the Heat. But massive win. I mean, I was talking about the Lakers earlier tonight because they had a massive road win against the second-best team in the league. This was the Miami Heat getting a massive road win over the very best team in the league. So shout-out to the Heat. Shout-out to Bam Adebayo. Might have to start talking about the Heat a little bit more, which could be fun because they're a fun team to watch. And Jimmy Butler is one of my favorite players. All right, guys, that is all I have for tonight. Don't forget to check out that Lakers instant breakdown a little, or instant reaction a little bit further back in our feed. I hope you guys have a great weekend. No more shows on Saturday and Sunday, but we will be back on Monday as is usual. As always, I sincerely appreciate you guys supporting me, and I will see you guys next time.